arm or protects your sword arm more. Spears are spectacular in an open field. Can't prove pole arms don't pull their weight. For sheer protectiveness, you wield a shield. And the great sword is no doubt great. But seriously, who wants to haul all this crap? Imagine you're an adventurer, or a traveling mercenary or duelist in a fantasy world, or perhaps some idealized form of history, and you have to pick your equipment. So many weapons to choose from, and some have very obvious benefits. You know, spears, with all their range and their ability to deliver very quick thrusts, halberds and other polearms with their powerful cuts, and ability to hook and control the opponent's weapon or limbs are tremendously useful. Help. That was unexpected. Fortunately, it didn't ruin anything. That plop sound though. Help, help, help. You don't always want to carry that much with you. Sure, if you're, say, a knight with a horse, you can load a lot of your stuff onto the horse. You can tie your shield to the saddle, possibly your polearm. And either way, weapons like this are a lot easier to carry on horseback. Although there are certain weight limits to keep in mind as well, particularly if you're wearing a full suit of armor, there's only so much the horse can safely carry over longer periods of time without getting exhausted or injured. If you're on foot, this is not really fantastic to walk around with. Sure, you can use it as a walking stick, which has its purposes, but it's quite a bit heavier and more cumbersome. So a, an actual quarter staff would be a lot easier to carry for that purpose. A spear, also a bit easier. But what if you want to travel as light as possible? So you don't even really want to wear heavy gauntlets or really any significant armor. You just want to be able to carry your weapons on your person so they're ready at any moment. For me personally, the most obvious answer that comes to mind is some form of longsword, or in this case, tricks messer, you know, a sword that you can use with both hands, where you have a number of techniques available and some versatility. In real life history, daggers were popular for civilian self-defense, as were a variety of swords, you know, like a single-handed messer, for example, a rapier or rapier and dagger, arming sword and buckler, etc. Not all of these are equally safe. A long sword or a single-handed sword without full hand protection and without a defensive offhand weapon is somewhat risky. There are plenty of ways to exploit the, the hand or the forearm as an opening. There are ways to try to defend against that. It requires a lot of skill and experience to not have your hand or arm cut to pieces. So what would make for the most impenetrable defense? Of course, a truly impenetrable defense doesn't exist, but how can you increase the odds of keeping yourself safe and uninjured? Obviously, the best protection is a large shield. The larger, the better. But again, lugging this around is not particularly convenient, so let's forget about that. So what about its tiny cousin, the buckler? This is much more convenient to carry. Uh, this one even has a hook to hang from your belt. And there are these extra tiny ones that are even easier to carry. They weigh very little. And uh, you can use this together with your sword to keep your sword hand safe and also use it you know, to cover yourself in various ways. And there are a lot of benefits to it. It still leaves plenty of openings. If you keep the sword and buckler in front of you, you are pretty well covered. But depending on the angle, your sword hand can be vulnerable from the other side. You now you can adjust, but as soon as you do, you leave the other side open, of course. So somebody who faints to your left side and then changes to your right could cause you to overcommit and then can attack your opening here. 
Of course, that's a universal problem in martial arts. You can't cover everything at once and your opponents will want to fake you out, to open you up where they want to attack you. Pretty standard, but the more angles and more quadrants you can close with your passive defense, so to speak, the better off you are. So with a larger buckler, you're of course safer, and then it's a matter of balancing how much protection you want and how much weight and encumbrance you're willing to accept. Uh, this covers substantially more than the other one, not just because it's longer and a bit wider, but also because it curves around the hand to an extent. That in of itself is useful. Also this curvature here, along with the spikes, allows you to catch an opponent's blade and control and manipulate it. So that's pretty useful. Then we've got this nifty device here, the Gorang, a Chinese hook shield. This covers quite a bit while minimizing the amount of weight that you have to carry around. This is quite light. So you've got these two steel bars here that curve at the end to form hooks. And I've demonstrated that in another video, link down below if you haven't seen it yet. And this is quite versatile because now you have a lot more to work with height-wise, so to speak. And considering that we're humans are generally taller than they're wide, we're not dwarves. So it makes more sense to have more length available. This way you can cover more of your body while moving less. So for example, attacks to the leg are very common against shield users. You typically uh, faint high, attack low, or vice versa. So if you have to move the shield all the way down, you're opening up your upper body, and if you cover your head, you're opening more of your lower body. There are of course ways to deal with that, like pulling the leg back instead of trying to defend that low, but we're just talking covering as much as possible and maximizing our defensive capabilities. So with something like this, you don't have to go that low to catch an attack to the leg. And these hooks also have an important defensive role. They are not just for controlling the opponent's weapon or limbs. If you imagine you're uh, defending low and the opponent strikes here. So this is where you're weaker, just like with a sword. You know, the further you go away from the hand, the more leverage works on you and the harder it is to hold against. So if somebody cuts low, they could blow through. And of course, as soon as this collapses inward, if this was just a straight bar, the sword would simply slide off and get you anyway. Because there's a hook, it gets caught there. So even if your defense collapses, or let's say it's high, even if it collapses, chances are you're still safe. And then you've got the spike to catch an opponent's sword and control it. And you could, of course, also punch with it. So this is a great way to maximize protectiveness while keeping bulk and weight down. Of course, there are still ways to, for the opponent to get around it. You know, if they, you know, for example, throw a feint over here and you overcommit, now you're open here so they can attack the arm again. So ideally you would move this as little as possible and also change your body orientation in order to defend. So if somebody cuts over here, if you step away from it and then move in, then you're good. Plus, of course, if you're using a sword at the same time, you can commit to defending on one side with the sword and defending the other with the hook shield. Time for anachronistic culture mishmash. If you want to defend mainly your left side with the shield and your right side with the sword, now it makes a lot of sense to use something like a basket hilt. So now you have your hand also protected very well. With just a basket hilt sword, the opponent can do things like faint to your upper left for you to raise your hanging parry over here and then attack your arm because now it's a lot more vulnerable. You can avoid that by parrying like this, 
but you're still, anytime you're crossing your body with your forearm, it's of course vulnerable. So a feint can still be effective. However, if you cover anything on your left side with a shield, this is pretty difficult to approach. You know, if you want to feint here, attack there, doesn't really matter too much. If you feint to the lower right opening, trying to draw the sword down and then strike to the upper right, well, this way, it's not happening. Now the entire right side is closed off. If you then try to attack the other side, it can be covered with a shield while attacking with a thrust at the same time or a cut, of course. Now these two would interfere more than a buckler would. Since you have these extra pieces sticking up, you can't move the sword like this. So you always have to coordinate them properly, which is with training, not that big of a deal. It's the same principle in Zulu stick fighting and other styles that use a shield or buckler along with a pairing stick or similar device. So this way you just cover quite a bit more. And of course, with a stick, the advantage is also it's readily available. You know, if it gets broken or caught up too much, you throw it away and you get a new one. What I also imagine being particularly effective would be a single-handed version of the large dueling shields you see in medieval manuscripts. So these were used with two hands. They're quite odd. They're really just for a judicial dueling context. They weren't used for battlefield or civilian self-defense use. But if you scale this down, and turn it into a single-handed shield that has this point projecting on both ends and with the hooks for controlling the opponent's weapon and uh, also keeping yourself safer. That would work quite well, I think. Here's a version that I quite like. Ties in with the video I made about arm blades, you know, talking about a shield that has a blade attached to it. Uh, it can either be attached to it directly or you could combine it with a parrying dagger like this. Uh, imagine there's also a strap here to hold on to, to, to give it a little bit more stability. The nice thing about this combination is that it covers more of the inside. The inside can be vulnerable and exploited by the opponent, uh, for example, by throwing a false edge cut to the inside or, you know, fainting you out and then cutting to the inside when you open yourself up too much. If you combine a parrying dagger that has this kind of shell guard, now you've closed most of this off. Not all of it. The, um, the forearm is still somewhat exposed, but again, you cannot absolutely 100% cover everything. But the nice thing is here, you have options for manipulating the opponent's blade, you know, similar to rapier and dagger. It could, of course, also be used with an ice pick grip. If you really want to, I suppose, you could just combine everything or perhaps have a specially designed dagger that has a spike or blade attached to the pommel as well. And then you would be able to, once again, have the benefits of getting more parrying real estate, so to speak, while also being able to use it offensively. Again, the question becomes, how much would you be willing to carry around? It would definitely be more convenient or at least quicker to draw if you had a blade already attached to the shield. So all you need to do is just grab the shield, you know, slip through the strap and use it. And you wouldn't want to project blades or spikes in all directions because then again, it becomes a major inconvenience to carry around, possibly dangerous to yourself and others. And I think the hook shield is a really good middle ground between convenience and defense. The problem I see with carrying this would be that the top hook is always in the way. Like it sticks out weirdly, even if you try to carry it as low as possible, it's still not fantastic. So what I'm thinking might be the most efficient and practical would be to carry the sword on the left side, if you're right-handed, if you're left-handed, just mirror everything, of course, and uh, have a buckler with a blade attached to it that hooks onto the blade that's here. So you can reach down, pull that, and then you can draw your sword at the same time. 
if that's all the time you have, you just use those two together. And of course, instead of a round buckler, it can also be the elongated arm shield type. Uh, if you do have the time, you could draw your parrying dagger and then grab it as well. So now you've got the full setup. Now you've got all the benefit of having this much to work with for protection. Here and there you've got those two ends for offensive purposes and then you can also use it together with your sword. All right, that was a lot of blah blah, but I hope you found it inspirational. Hopefully it gave you some ideas for character design, writing, GMing, or whatever other creative shenanigans you might be up to. Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks. Thank you.